Okay, good morning. This is, uh, we are coming towards the end of this, of this uh, course on the fundamentals of the vitreous or of the glassy state. And today we are going to talk about overall crystallization, the combination of nucleation and growth. Um, unfortunately, I was too busy to prepare transparencies so we are going to give, to give this class in an old-fashioned way, using the whiteboard today. I hope I can remember all the equations and derivations to do in the blackboard or in the whiteboard. So um, let's start with a very simple problem that I want you to think and work for a few minutes in the following problem. You can visualize like a calm lake, like the lake we have here at the university. We have a lake here, very nice, calm, no wind, very calm lake. And you throw like a bunch of stones in the lake. If you throw stones in the lake, you find a situation which resembles surface crystallization. The time the stones hit the lake, the surface, you have the nucleation of some waves. And these waves will grow. Will grow from a fixed number of sites. Well, the sites are the stones. So we have a, a certain number of sites and these waves will grow and will grow and will grow. You can observe them growing, growing, growing until their fronts meet. When the fronts meet, they will stop growing that direction, continue in other direction, but not where they meet. And this is what happens. This is exactly what happens during the simple case of surface crystallization. You can have a plate of glass with a certain number of nucleating sites, impurities, cracks, whatever, bubbles on the surface, broken bonds. You have a certain fixed number of sites, you hit treat the glass, and crystal growth will start from some of these sites, from the active sites. This is surface crystallization. This is how it happens. And if you assume that the crystals are circular, they are growing on the surface, they are also growing underneath the surface, towards the center of the glass, but you can look at the surface crystallization kinetics. What's the area fraction? So my question is, what's the surface area fraction of these particles as a function of time for a certain <coughs> a uh, type of boundary condition, the number of particles per unit surface is in S, the growth rate is U, this is the growth rate of these waves, and the time is T. So I want you to think a little bit and try to write the expression for the surface fraction crystallized or the surface fraction covered by these waves as a function of time. And you can think that the area, if this is a square, L by L, the area is L square. So try to write up this expression. One minute to you. So you can think a little bit rather than listening to me all the time. 
Okay, let's, uh, let's solve this problem. So, the surface area covered by these waves is equal to the area of each one, which is pi, r is the radius of each sphere, times the number of circles, of circles, divided by the area of the lake. But n divided by the area is n s. And r, the radius for a constant growth rate, r is equal to u times t, the growth rate versus time. This is the definition of growth rate. The r dt is the growth rate. So we can replace r by u times t, because our variable is u, the growth rate, n divided by L squared is ns. So we come up with this equation pi uh, u squared. Sorry, let me pi n s u square t square. This is the area fraction covered by these circular waves. Or by crystals in the case of surface crystallization from a fixed number of sites. We have no nucleation rate now. It's a fixed number of sites. Like I thrown the stones in the lake, the number of sites is constant. In surface nucleation, you have a certain fixed number of sites. This is the simplest case ever of crystallization. Surface nucleation from a constant number of sites, constant growth rate of circular particles. But this expression has a problem. What's the problem with this expression here? It, 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 it does not take into account the fact that at some stage, some stage, these fronts will meet each other and has to stop. But this, this very simple calculation assumes that one particle can grow inside the other particle. So the net result is that it always grows with time and never stops. So if we are going to plot the evolution of the fraction crystallized with time, it goes over than one and actually goes to infinity. So the, this plot of that equation is something like this. You know, at some stage, for infinitely long time, it will go to infinity. But the area fraction crystallized cannot be larger than one. You know, from zero to one. This is the fraction crystallized. So, some very clever people in, in the period 1937 to 1940 or so, there are Johnson and Mel, Johnson and Mel, Melvin Avrami and Komogorov, independently, these authors independently, they solve this problem. This is a mathematical problem, you know. They call this as the fictitious volume fraction or area fraction in this particular case because it can be larger than one. And they solved this problem by a very elegant solution. 
they demonstrated that alpha, the real surface fraction, is equal to 1 minus xp, the minus the fictitious volume fraction. This is the Johnson, this is the overall Johnson Mel Avrami Komogorov equation, the JMAC equation. Very simple mathematical solution. And then for any type of phase transformation, if you know the expression for the fictitious volume fraction or fictitious surface fraction, you can always plug the solution here and have a solution for the evolution of the real, the real volume fraction or surface fraction. And then this real volume or surface fraction will be equal to the fictitious volume fraction, but then slowly departs and reach this form. So this is actually the expression for the evolution of the real surface fraction. It's always a, an S-shaped curve, S-shaped curve. And this one here refers to the fictitious volume fraction. <clears throat> now, um, having said that, we can now move on and try to look in more uh, realistic or more common problems. So let's then try to solve now the volume fraction transformed. Now you can think of a cube, of a glass piece, a cubic piece with internal crystallization, a homogeneous crystallization occurring continuously. So for the case, so the case two, case number two, is homogeneous nucleation, homogeneous nucleation. Uh, let's assume a steady state conditions, just to simplify the problem. Steady state nucleation rates, that's I zero as a function of temperature, and then Let's assume spherical crystals, spherical crystals, and uh, constant growth rate. By constant, I just mean um, that the radius versus time grows linearly for a, given, for a given temperature. And the same for the nucleation rate. I'm assuming that the number of crystals per unit volume versus time just grows linearly. In this way, we have a steady state constant nucleation rate and constant growth rate U for a particular temperature. So the nucleation rate depends on temperature, the growth rate depends on temperature, but they are constant for any temperature. Then if we move to another temperature, you have a plot like this. If we move to another temperature, you have a plot like this. But for each temperature, they are constant. And the crystals are spherical. So you can visualize, uh, if you take micrographs, 
of a system undergoing such a process, you, the time evolution would be something like, let's uh, split this blackboard here. And then the evolution would be something like this. Okay, some nuclei form, and then for a longer time, those previously formed nuclei will grow, and at the same time, other nucleation events will take place and so on. This will be the kind of evolution that we have for this case number two. Remember that case number one, case number one was surface, surface nucleation from a fixed number of sites with a constant growth rate of circular particles. This is a different case. Homogeneous nucleation, steady state conditions, spherical crystals with a constant growth rate. In this particular case, the fictitious volume fraction crystallized, now it's volume, not surface, can be described by, for spherical crystals, right? 4 pi over 3, now the integral from time 0 to time t of i I depends on the temperature on time and then the integral from zero to time t of u that depends on the temperature and time dt dash dt to the cube power. Um, <clears throat> this is the overall, the overall, uh, sorry, a key is T. Expression for the fictitious volume fraction is a function of time. This in isothermal conditions, the temperature is constant. I'm trying to understand the evolution of the volume fraction for these particular conditions here. Let me give you two more minutes now to try to solve this expression for this boundary, these a boundary conditions here. Two or three minutes. <clears throat> the problem here is simplified by the fact that I have said in the boundary conditions that we are working with steady state conditions. So the nucleation rate and growth rate does not depend on time for this particular boundary condition. This is the general equation for any condition. When we have known steady state effects and things like that, that you have worked, Maziar, we have to take the full expression of Kashyev here, for instance. But in this case, I have simplified. I said that I does not depend on the time, only the temperature. 
But for a fixed temperature, this is a constant. For a fixed temperature, this is a value. For instance, this value here. So we can take out of the integral. So the, the general thing is that uh, what's the integral of dt? The integral of dt is t. t from 0 to t double dash. So it's t to the third power, t to the third power. Now we are going to integrate again t to the third power from 0 to t is t to the fourth power divided by 4. So in the end, this is very simple, we have pi over 3, i0, because this, for this particular case, I'm working with steady state conditions, u0 to the third power, u to the third power, and the time to the fourth power. So this is the resolution, very simple. And this is what you find in textbooks. It's very common. This is the Avrami expression. Well, this Avrami expression came from the fact that we are assuming spherical crystals, steady state nucleation, constant growth rate. Therefore, the final expression is alpha v, as a function of time, is 1 minus xp, d minus pi over 3 i0 u cube t4. This is the johnson melvin expression. And the exponent of time is normally called m, the Avrami uh, parameter or Avrami coefficient or whatever. This is the Avrami parameter. And many people, uh, when they are studying the phase transformation from any material, what they normally do is to measure alpha versus time. So you can use optical microscopy, electron microscopy, X-ray diffraction, DESC methods. You can measure the density of the system. So I'm talking about the problem that you have a glass piece, heat treat this glass piece, and follow the evolution of crystallization with time. This is the overall crystallization. So experimentally, one can then produce a plot like alpha v versus time and measure, you know. Somehow measure the evolution of, of crystallinity as a function of time by some technique. There are several techniques. Every technique is, is, is more or less adequate to a particular problem. For instance, if your crystals are nanometric, you have to use like electron microscopy techniques or so on. If, uh, the volume fraction is very small. You cannot use DSC techniques. DSC techniques are good for high volume fraction. If the particles are larger than five microns or so, then you can use even optical microscopy and so on. X-ray diffraction techniques. There are many techniques which can be used. Of course, they all have, all measurements have some error and you have some error have some error here. But this is much easier to measure than either nucleation rates or growth rates. It's very time consuming, as we have seen before, and, and, and very delicate to actually measure the nucleation rates and the growth rates at different temperatures. 
different temperatures. This, please recall that this is for a particular, this is for a particular temperature T1. Uh, now, sorry, let me do this in black. This is for T1, T1. However, we can also measure the same kinetics, say in a higher temperature T2, another set of results, and so on. Now, if you look at the shape of this equation, uh, when the crystal nucleation, crystal growth rates are not, are not uh, variable, this is like a constant. All this is a constant for a particular, remember, for a particular temperature. So we can replot that kind of curve in a double log scale. If we take log, double logarithms, because we are interested in n, we can also produce a plot like this one here. So like log of log of 1 minus alpha v minus 1 versus log t. If we linearize the type of curve, we will end up with a straight line. And the intercept here is the log of k of this constant here. We can calculate. It will be the logarithm of the constant. So we can estimate this constant. In the slope, we will give which parameter? m. The slope will give m. Why are we interested in m? We are interested because m will give some insight on the mechanism of crystallization. We can now produce a table, let's see, a table here for different values of m for different process. Let me see if I remember all these numbers, but we can produce a table like um, um, like this. Interface controlled growth or diffusion. Interface or diffusion. Then we can have a homogeneous nucleation or heterogeneous nucleation from a certain number of sites. Homogeneous nucleation with a certain nucleation rate. So, by interface controlled growth, I mean to say, to refer to cases where the chemical composition of the crystal that is growing is the same as the parent glass. So only rearrangements at the crystal glass interfaces are necessary. In the other case, when the composition of the growing crystals are very 
different from the composition of the glass, diffusion, long range diffusion of the chemical elements are necessary. So we can distinguish between polymorphic or interfacial controlled growth from diffusion controlled growth for homogeneous nucleation and for heterogeneous nucleation. Homogeneous nucleation is exactly the case we have discussed here, where you, you have a nucleation rate, the number of crystals always grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And grow. Heterogeneous nucleation normally occurs very fast from a fixed number of sites. So here we are assuming a fixed or constant number of sites. And here we assume an increasing, increasing number of sites with time. This is all for isothermal. I'm talking about isothermal treatments, you know, some fixed temperature. Isothermal treatments produce this plot. From the plot, we can calculate M and then compare with the theoretical values of M. And the theoretical values of M can be seen for one dimensional growth, two dimensional, and three dimensional. By one dimensional growth, I mean acicular particles, rod shape, you know, rod shape particles. There are some crystals like in volastonite crystals or molite crystals, they grow almost unidirectional, like this, rod shape. Or you can have plates or disks. This is two-dimensional growth. Or cubes or stars or spheres, three-dimensional growth. This is the shape of the crystals that grow. Now, people have then solved, and you can do this at homework, to solve the general equation for all these cases here. If you do that, uh, we did for one case. For one case that we did, m is equal 4. This is the result of our resolution of this integral. m is equal 4 for which case here in this table? Interface three-dimensional. This one. This is m equal 4. For this case here, what's the value of m? 2. 2 means heterogeneous nucleation, two-dimensional growth, right? Interface two-dimensional growth. So this is 2. We have solved this case. You can solve for all these cases, and you find out that for two-dimensional growth, interface controlled growth, or two-dimensional crystals, m is equal to 3. This is the table for M, the Avrami parameter. Here, M is equal to 2. For heterogeneous nucleation, here is 1, here is 3. For diffusion controlled growth, diffusion controlled growth is different from this case here. Uh, from this case here, the radius versus time no longer um, evolves linearly. So for diffusion controlled growth, the radius follow typically the square root of time square root of time. So in this case, here we have 1.5, 2.5, 3.5.
Here we have half, 1.5, 2.5. So the maximum value that you can have is 4. There is only one possibility. There is one possibility where nucleation rate is self-catalytic. Like, if the first nuclei that form serve as a catalyzer for the second round, which serve as a catalyzer for the third round, I've never seen such a case in glasses, at least. There are reports of such case in the literature for some uh, chemical compounds and, and, and complex materials, but not in glasses. Now, crystallization of glasses, the maximum value that you can find is four. That's the case for interface controlled growth, continuous homogeneous nucleation in the volume, continuous constant growth. All the other cases are covered in this table. So people use this table to evaluate or to analyze their experiments. Like Maziar and Mina, you are working with a non two different non-stoichiometric materials. You are working with enstatite glass ceramics, Mina is working with a lithium metasilicate glass ceramic, which have many other components, five, six other components. This is a nice way to analyze. At some stage, you have to measure the evolution of the volume fraction crystallized, linearize, and see what type, what type of M you end up with. There are a little bit complication here, because the complications may arise here. If M is equal to, you can have either internal nucleation of unidimensional crystals or surface nucleation of circular, nucleation growth of circular crystals. Or you may have a situation where M is 1.5, M is 1.5, you can have diffusion controlled growth of unidimensional crystals with homogeneous nucleation or diffusion controlled growth of two dimensional crystals in heterogeneous nucleation. So these cases have to be resolved by a detailed microscopy work. If you look in transmitted light, reflected light, you can find out the shape of your crystals and then you know to which case you're working with. See? I'm trying to explain this to you because this is, this is very simple and most students do not know where this table that you can find in textbooks come from. This table is derived using this equation here for the different cases. You can do this at home. It will take a long time here, but you can do, I did this before. You know, you can come up to this table. Yes? What if your experimental data, uh, you have like M1.75, between two more and one? Right. This is a good question. Sometimes Graziel is saying that, well, sometimes you come up with like 1.75. Well, there are several possibilities. One possibility is this here. You know, as there are errors, there's always some errors, you know, you have to be able also to estimate the error in M. Is M plus or less 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04? Then sometimes the error is so large because the, the difference here is only 0.5. If your error is 0.5, then you are in trouble. So the answer is you have to repeat the experiment 
do a better statistics, do more experiments to get your error maximum to like 0.1. So, so part of the answer, um, you have to check your error. And this is true for all measurements that you do, all. Any measurement, an editor, I'm an editor, a journal editor. I have been a journal editor for more than 20 years. And the first question the reviewers ask and the editors ask, what's the error? Sometimes the error is very small. Sometimes it's so big that you cannot conclude anything. What's the error? This is a, my advice to you. You're doing thesis work. Always, what's the error? Like Graziella is using the SciGlass database to find out lots of properties of binary internary systems. Some, sometimes, Graziella, you have found that the error is larger than 100% sometimes. And there are many sources of the error. So, error. Second part of the answer is maybe you have more than one phase crystallizing. This is for one crystal phase. Like, if you have a complex glass in a certain temperature, two or three phases are crystallizing at the same time. Then the simplest assumptions do not work. And then you come up with crazy numbers, even if the error is small. Because you have one phase crystallizing, it's eating up some of the elements, the other phase also needs some of those elements. You have diffusion profiles. Things become much, much more complicated in multi-component systems where more than one phase crystallize. And you can have uh, different numbers. Uh, then this simplest theory is no longer applicable. So this theory is applicable. It describes very well the pure cases of one phase crystallizing purely by diffusion or purely by interface. Uh, for other cases, we don't know. You have to use um, numerical methods. This is a very nice analytical solution, but does not cover all the complex cases that we find in glass crystallization. Nevertheless, it's, it's useful uh, as a guide. Like I was attending a conference uh, called Material Science and Technology three weeks ago in the USA, and one guy was giving a talk on uh, calculating these Avrami coefficients for some particular glass using DSC. Well, his M values varied like crazy, but for some systems, the M was 7.5. 7.5. I told him something is wrong with your calculations. It cannot be. It cannot be larger than 4. It was 7.5. Something, I don't know what's wrong. It was a short paper, 15 minutes. You cannot visualize what was wrong. But from the end result, it, it was easy to predict that something was wrong there. 7.5. You'll never find this. Now, why am I talking about all these uh, procedures? One reason is that we can now calculate critical, critical, cooling rates for glass formation. You know that um, any material can form a glass. Even water, ionic liquids, metallic liquids, can form glasses if they're extremely quenched, very fast cooled. But it's nice to evaluate the glass forming ability. What's the critical or the minimum cooling rate necessary to vitrify a given liquid? 
I have a liquid and want to be able to calculate or predict how fast I have to, vitri to cool that liquid to, to make a glass, to make a glass. In one way, to estimate the critical cooling rates to vitrify a liquid is by constructing a so-called TTT curve. In a TTT curve, time transformation, temperature, we can have the temperature here, the time here, and with this equation, at any temperature, this varies and this varies. You remember that I and U depends on the temperature. So I can put one temperature here, calculate I0 and U, and see how long it takes to crystallize, say, let's say an alpha maximum of 10 to the minus 6. Very small. Let's say that anything which has less than 10 to the minus 6, this is an arbitrary low value, will be a glass. So if I have a material with less than 10 to the minus 6 of crystallized volume fraction, we define that as a glass. Then we can calculate. Well, at this temperature here, this is the time, and then I move the temperature and calculate the time, I move the temperature and calculate the time, then I move it again, I move it again, and calculate the time necessary to crystallize 10 to the minus 6. Well, I can calculate the time if I know the mechanism, etc., etc. If I know the mechanism, I know the M, I know the M here, I can fix this volume fraction, crystallize, and calculate the time. So this is the TTT curve for a given volume fraction. If the liquidus temperature here of my system, then I have a way to estimate the critical cooling rate. And the critical cooling rate will be given by this simple calculation here. The critical cooling rate, also known as R critical, will be TL minus the temperature of the nose. This is the nose of the curve. And this is the time at the nose. So this is an estimate is this slope here, TL minus T nose, divided by the time of the nose. Anything cooled faster than this rate here will be a glass. This is the region where we can form a glass. If we cool it slower, then we have a crystal or a semi-crystalline material with a volume fraction of at least 10 to the minus 6 of crystals. If you do this, then you find that like a metallic glass metallic glass, which is very difficult to make, have to be cooled at certain cooling rate larger than 10 to the power 4, like Kelvin. 
per second. Water, which is even more difficult, must be larger than 10 to the 9 or so, extremely difficult. Like a soda lime silica glass, soda lime silica glass may be something of the order of less than 0.1 Kelvin per second. So the glass forming ability increases in this way. Glass forming ability increases in this way. And now we have a quantitative, a quantitative method to evaluate the glass forming ability of a given material. Of course, this is very time consuming and to be able to draw such a curve, you have to know the variation of nucleation rates and growth rates as a function of temperature and also the mechanism of nucleation growth of your particular system. This is actually very time consuming uh, to do. However, it gives you an insight on this uh, physical phenomenon. There are several approximate ways to estimate critical cooling rates. There are approximate ways, but we do not have time to discuss all the details. I just want to tell you that this is a way <clears throat> to estimate these rates and um, to compare the glass forming ability of different materials. I must also tell you that this, is, this type of estimate has a, an error embedded on it because each of these data points are calculated isothermally. Like I take what's the time to crystallize this volume fraction at this particular temperature. And then what's the time at this other temperature. So they're isothermal. But this cooling curve here is known isothermal. The temperature is varying with time. So this is a kind of unfair comparison. So people have calculated precisely the critical cooling rates by taking the temperature and time dependence of nucleation growth rates. You can do a non isothermal integration. This was an isothermal integration. We can always do a non isothermal integration for a particular cooling rate. And then, <clears throat> just to tell you that this estimate is about 5 to 10 times larger than the real value of critical cooling rate. Just a warning for you. You can do this, some people do, but it's always larger, typically five times larger than the real value that you would have estimated by taking the non-isothermal integration of, of this equation here. But that's complicated and outside the scope of a simple class. If you're doing research in this area, I'll be glad to discuss how you can do uh, these non-isothermal integrations. I have done a few times and we have published on, on the subject. Here, the idea is just to give you this insight and with that, your final piece of homework. You can guess now, what's your final piece of homework? To calculate the critical cooling rates 
of the glasses that you have adopted, which will be very easy for you because the hard work is already done. You have <coughs> the crystal nucleation curve, the crystal growth curve as a function of temperature. So you can easily calculate the TTT and then doing this plot, you can estimate the critical cooling rate for your systems. And I know already the results because we have done this before. Let's remind here who has uh, let me make a table of your several systems here in this little piece here. Who has this calcium metasilicate, lithium disilicate, lithium diborate, uh, one, two, three, fresnoite. Um, I don't remember which, huh? barium disilicate, barium disilicate, any other system? Anortita. Uh, Anortite. Let me give you, I'll give you some hint. I don't remember the exact number, the exact number, but I tell you the champions of these systems. You're, nobody has working with Fresnoid, is it? No? So let me erase. One, two, three, you. Lithium diborate, you. Lithium disilicate, calcium metasilicate. So this is all. Um, the champion here will be likely this one, I think, and maybe also this one. Then the best glass formers, the best glass formers will be this and this. And this will be the second best. And this will be maybe similar to these ones. So I predict that the critical cooling rates of these three glasses, let me write down. First block, I think. First block, these three glasses will be number one. This will be number two. And the other two glasses will come in third place. This is my prediction. Let's, let's see after you calculate uh, the results that you get. The highest, highest critical cooling rates. Highest critical cooling rate, so the worst glass forming. Second highest, third highest. So the number three will be the best glass forming materials, I think. The best glass forming, so lower or lowest critical cooling rates.